this morning on the way to uh, on the way to Sunday school, I had the radio on and I just happened to be hearing our president speak from France, one of the cemeteries in France. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, I just kind of got the closing uh, part there, but uh, thinking of all of uh, all of our uh, troops that uh, down through the years uh, have gone to the far flung corners of the world, mostly to defend other people. And uh, <laughs> Sorry, folks. As the bugler was playing taps there in that cemetery. see me but I was moved to tears then and, and I thought I was going to be fine and <clears throat> when we started singing America's Beautiful Boy I thought you know we are so so phenomenally blessed we are so stunningly incredibly amazingly blessed that we don't even know how blessed we are and uh, Anyway, so no charge for that. That's really <coughs> it touches on it. But there are a couple of announcements that we try to make, and then we can uh, move on. Uh, hopefully, this afternoon, ladies' Bible study is going to be meeting here at one o'clock. So, ladies, I hope all of you are all psyched and excited and primed for that. That should be a, a great time. Um, Thursday this week, Thursday there is a community-wide worship service happening at uh, Hope Church, and it's also a fundraiser for um, the uh, Child Bridge. I, my suspicion is that this is going to be a great time. There are songwriters from all over the country that are gathering together here and going to be presenting some stuff there, so I think you're, there are going to be some top flight musicians as well as some some songwriters that are going to be presenting some of their stuff. I just expect, man, so if you're able to get out on Thursday night and go to Hope Church, I just, I think it will be a <coughs> phenomenal blessing. And plus, you know, any kind of a fundraiser for Child Bridge. Child Bridge is doing a remarkable, unique ministry, <laughs> connecting up uh, Christian families with the state social services, <clears throat> and they're just doing a number of things to build the bridge between the church and the state people that have anything to do with, with, with uh, the whole child uh, protective services sector. And in just a year or two, it has made a profound difference in the mindset of some. And our church participates. They will send out a notice if a, if a school teacher or somebody even has a, finds a child that has a real need, they will sometimes, they'll just send out a note to uh, the churches, and man, those needs are being met one after another after another, when the state can't do it. But the church has stepped up, and we're a part of that. And, uh, you know, so, but it, it's just interesting to see that, that happening. So Thursday night, big thing, good thing. You see in the back, we have some Operation Christmas Child boxes already gathered. <clears throat> there are more boxes to be taken, and so don't take one just for drill, but if you will fill it up, take it and bring it back next Sunday. These have to be in next Sunday in order to be able to get shipped around the world so that kids everywhere in the world are getting these boxes. That is just an example of Jesus' love to them over, over Christmas. So that's a great ministry as well. <clears throat> and uh, uh, there is also, for anybody that would be interested or able to participate this afternoon at the Hampton Garden, not the Hampton, but the, 
what is it, the Garden Inn, Hilton, Hilton Garden Inn, <clears throat> there is a dinner for all uh, veterans and families and all that's, I think, free of charge and quite a big deal from about 2 to 5. So if anybody would like to uh, uh, able to participate in that, good. So <clears throat> today is the very day that in our nation um, we call Veterans Day. It's a day when, as a nation, we honor those who have served in our nation's military. <clears throat> you know, in our flock, we are really blessed to have a number of veterans. I would say probably proportionately for this size of congregation that we have uh, probably a, more than our typical share. Um, and we have had some that are no longer among us that have served and uh, are, are, you know, some of them have come to the Lord right here in our midst and now gone on to be with the Lord. But uh, Romans 13, 7 says this, Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. It was suggested that this morning we maybe take a few minutes, and we will do that a little, a little later on, but to honor um, all of those in our congregation that are, are veterans and maybe ask them each to share just a little bit about their experience, um, uh, you know, what, just so you can tell kind of what unit you're with or whatever and give just a few minutes of kind of quickie summary of your, your military experience. But uh, most Every honest vocation is worthy of respect and honor. Um, and those more specifically gifted or diligent in certain areas typically are, you know, <coughs> eligible for more honor. I mean, in, in almost every arena of life, I am always amazed at watching craftsmen do whatever it is that they do. You know, I mean, you watch somebody blowing glass, or you can watch somebody fixing cars, or watch somebody building houses, or whatever it is, and... You know, there are craftsmen that have different gifts and abilities and talents that can all contribute to the whole. Um, and any honorable work is worthy of honor. But those who are, uh, have served in the military or uh, law enforcement or first responders, it seems the very nature of the job subjects them to a greater hazard. And there are, uh, these are, are are tasks that, although not every person that does it obviously is a believer, still the rule is a God-ordained rule of protecting the rest of us. Believers in Christ are citizens of earth and we're citizens of heaven. Uh, folks, I'm a Christian, I'm a patriot, I, I'm pro-America. It's not that I'm anti anybody else. It's just that I'm an American. You know, I didn't earn my citizenship. I don't deserve my citizenship. I was just born here. But I was born here, you know. And not everybody here probably was born in the United States of America, but here we are. We're here today. And how... It, it's always a challenge as a pastor how to deal with some of these national holidays. Because... I don't want to just baptize everything that is American, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and as though somehow that's Christian, because that's not the case. And yet, how do we render honor uh, where honor is due? And so that's a little bit the challenge I have, you know, today. We are really blessed uh, in that, uh, as citizens of America, there have been very few conflicts between our faith and our nation. Now think with me a second. Now you may not realize what a blessing that is, but there are many, 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 many places on earth today, probably by far the vast majority of the human race, lives in situations that either now or in the recent past, it's been illegal to be a Christian. Or persecution happens in a whole variety of different ways. Well, in America, you know, the fact that I'm a Christian and that I'm a patriot, those have never had to come into great conflict. And uh, that, man, that's a phenomenal blessing. Mm -hmm. If a conflict arises between our faith and our nation, we've got to follow King Jesus. 
But if both are aligned, what a phenomenal, stunning blessing that is. So, um, I believe that as Christians, we ought to know how to live in the environment that we are in. You know, no matter where we're from, when we come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, wherever we are, we need to be salt and light in that environment. I believe the Bible is written for all men of all ages in every environment, and it is applicable to believers in Christ no matter where we are from. But man, to be in a place where we can practice our faith freely, publicly, here we are in a, a public hotel, you know, gathering together to worship, singing without any fear of anybody coming in. You know, I mean, there's a remote fear of, you know, some lunatic coming in that wants to hurt. But, you know, we don't have to worry that the government's going to send in their troops to, you know, take us out or round us up. Man, I, I can't even wrap my mind around the blessing that is because I've always had it and I've taken it for granted. So I'd like to take a little bit of time this morning and kind of contemplate this whole business of the military, how that fits in with a Christian worldview, with warfare. and all. I mean, there are just a lot of pieces to that. How do we as Christians respond to this concept, you know, of the military? Um, the world would be a, there's no way to even calculate what the world would look like had it not been for the United States of America and our military. Mm -hmm. Going at least back, you think, of World War I, I mean, it was America that came into the fray that helped turn the tide. Uh, World War I was to be the war that ends all wars. That was the perception of the time. That was kind of the slogan. Boy, if we get engaged in this, we'll clean up the world and it'll be a wonderful place. The war to end all wars. Uh, world War II came along. What, what would the world look like had not the United States of America been able to rise to the occasion Amen. and supply, really bring freedom to many places in the world? and be a light and a beacon to the world. Why is it that many countries, you know, have fences to keep people in, and we have to have fences to keep people out because who is there in the world that would not like to live here? You know, I mean, there are places, there are other wonderful places in the world, but man, there's a lot of other places that if people could get here to stay, they would, they would run phenomenal risks to be able to do that because we are so amazingly blessed. So I want to give a little bit of a brief history of, of, this, of this day. The 11th day, uh, the 11th hour, uh, which is we're right here, just about there, but when I was coming in, it was the 11th you know, hour of the 11th day of the 11th uh, month. If I, I don't know if I said that right, but uh, it, however you're supposed to say it, uh, you know, I mean, it, that was when World War I, the hostilities ceased in World War I. It's hard for me to imagine the joy and the euphoria that happened across the world when that kind of warfare stopped. I mean, up until that moment, there were literally millions of people being killed because of this war. And when the war stopped, that had to be a phenomenal euphoric time. So the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month became called Armistice Day. And uh, that's, that's when it be, and that was in about uh, in November of the 11th of 1918. So it's a hundred years from today. This is the centennial day. You know, this day comes at different times right in the month because of how the calendar operates, but it happens to be this very day, Sunday. Uh, in 1921, an unknown soldier was uh, from World War I was buried in Arlington National Cemetery on a hillside overlooking the Potomac River and the city of Washington. England and France held similar ceremonies where an unknown soldier was buried in each nation's highest place of honor. England's Westminster Abbey and France's Arc de Triomphe. 
Each nation recognized the celebrated ending of World War I. As I mentioned, it was to be the war that ends all wars. Congress officially named it Armistice Day in 1926. It became a national holiday 12 years later. And, you know, if the idealistic hope had survived that this would be the war to end all wars, it probably would have just stayed that. It would have been Armistice Day, and that was it. But uh, it was not long before, a few years later, war broke out in Europe. And December 7th, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, um, bringing America into the war. Sixteen and a half million Americans took part. 405,399, if that figure is completely accurate, died in service. More than 292,000 in battle and 671,000 plus were wounded. Now, contemplate that for a minute. <clears throat> you know, that was in a day when I think the, the population of America was like 150 million more or less. So there was scarcely a family in America that was not impacted. And that says nothing about England and France and all, and, and for that matter, Germany and Italy and, you know, Japan and all of those families also that were profoundly impacted by the decisions of their leaders to go into war. So realizing the sacrifices of World War II, and then later Korea, uh, in 1954, President Eisenhower signed a bill proclaiming November 11th as Veterans Day to honor those who have served America in all the wars. On Memorial Day in 1958, an unknown soldier killed in World War II and another in the Korean War were interred in the plaza beside the unknown soldier of World War I. In 1984, an unknown serviceman from the Vietnam War was buried there. I understand, and some of you might be able to correct me, but from what I read, it sounded like this soldier was subsequently identified, and that tomb remains empty. Uh, so you can do your own research to see whether that's an accurate thing. But uh, So to honor all these men, all these people who gave their lives in all the wars, the U.S. Army 3rd Infantry Honor Guard, <clears throat> called the Old Guard, keeps day and night vigil. And, uh, you know, you read the account of some of these guys, they may not be in combat, but, I mean, if it's snowing, if it's raining, if it's hailing, if it's a hurricane, those guys are out there honoring, you know, those who have gone ahead. It's a, a moving thing, from what I understand, to be there to see even the changing of the guard. Uh, quite a a way that as a nation we can remember and honor. For a brief time in 1968, Congress changed Veterans Day to the fourth day or the fourth Monday in October. Uh, but in 1978 it was returned to the original significant date of November 11th. The focal point for official national ceremonies for Veterans Day is the memorial amphitheater around the Tomb of the Unknowns. At 11 a.m. On November 11th, a combined color guard representing all military service executes present arms at the tomb. A presidential wreath is laid, the bugler plays taps, and the rest of the ceremony takes place in the amphitheater. Attempting to remember. You know, over and over again, God told the children of Israel, I want you to remember. I want you to remember how you got here. I want you to remember these things. And he gave the feasts that people were to gather specifically and pointedly to remember. You know, what happens with us, you know, uh, the Vietnam War <clears throat> was my era. And those were troubled days for those of you old enough to remember that. But for others, that's just ancient history. No comprehension. You know, young folks have no idea about that. I have no real personal idea about World War II, you know, World War I, any of these things. But in that day and in that era, those things powerfully, profoundly shaped the thoughts and the hearts of, of entire cultures. So I would like for us just to take a moment and uh, have our, all of those who are veterans to stand, if you would, 
Uh, some of you may not even know who was or wasn't a veteran, but if you were a veteran of the United States military, would you just stand up this morning? All right. Well, would you take a minute and tell us a little bit about just, you know, how you got it? Marvin, we'll let you go first so you can sit down, man. Okay. <laughs> well, I had quite a mil uh, military life in one sense. 1950, I started college. And in order to stay there and not get drafted, you had to take uh, reserve officer training for four years which I did. So I had four years of military time. In the summer we had special camps, but we always had uh, military dresses at the university. And then, so then that was, when that was finished, I was supposed to become a second lieutenant. And at 1954 there was too many officers. They said, no, we we're not even going to let you come into the service as an officer, but we will let you come in to, as a, just as a beginning uh, military and serve two years. So then I took that option and uh, spent uh, two years of my life in Cheyenne, Wyoming, mm. which is a military base that never had an airplane on it. All it had was 11 schools. So. Hmm. So I, actually, I had a long career. Actually, about uh, four and two, six, six years of military, and then they finally, uh, about uh, three years later, they finally gave me my commission when I was off duty. And, <laughs> and I still, I guess, I still have that designation. All right. I never served. All <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, that's it. I had no idea. That is a wonderful account. Yeah, that's good. So I was in the um, ROTC. Uh -huh. I became the highest ranking female officer in the United States at the time. Really? Um, mm -hmm. uh, I was a colonel. All right. Yep. Wow. And, um, <laughs> then I went on to I went on to college, so that doesn't count to me. No, <laughs> I went on to uh, college. Um, Continued on with ROTC um, and was in the National Guard until my father got injured and then I had to step away. So I did serve, but I don't feel like I served. I hear you. <laughs> I, believe me, I hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Rob. Uh, I was blessed to have served uh, 20, 20 years in the United States Army. I was a uh, counterintelligence uh, special agent. Um, I served uh, during the uh, Cold War, was uh, stationed over in a uh, counterintelligence field office in Grafenbeer, Germany. I was responsible for parts of the East German and the Czechoslovakian borders. I was over there when Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear these walls down. Uh, I saw the walls come down. Uh, I saw the people come pouring out wow. of Eastern Europe. Wow. Uh, it was an amazing time. Wow. Um, I served. Uh, in Panama, I was blessed to be over there in 1999 when we actually turned over the Panama Canal to the, under the Carter-Torres Treaty back to Panama. And I moved the uh, U.S. Army south out of there to Puerto Rico. It was a and neat and interesting time to serve in Puerto Rico. I spent uh, two tours in uh, South Korea. My first tour uh, was back in 1990, I believe it was, or uh, excuse me, uh, 94, and uh, which was the... Uh, and I served in the 2nd Infantry Division uh, along uh, or just south of the demilitarized zone. But my area of responsibility was for the DMZ. I've been to Panmunjom. I've seen the Peace Village there. And uh, that was the year that the grandfather passed away and we all thought we were going to go to war. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that was an interesting time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, yeah. Uh, I've uh, been a START Treaty Inspector, worked in uh, um, checking out Russian ballistic missile facilities. And uh, that was an interesting time. I've had the, the keys to the, uh, uh, the Trinity test site. I was uh, um, where we blew up our first nuclear weapon. I was with an organization, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, that uh, built um, uh, 
very uh, uh, different types of uh, weapons and explosives, and I was responsible for some of the security for that. So that was a, an interesting deal. Hmm. Um, eight of my 20 years in the service, I was uh, deployed away from home. Wow. And, uh, but uh, I was really blessed to have been a part of it and seen a lot of neat things. So, mm. thank you. All right, thank you, man. That's it. Joe. Uh, I, I don't have nearly as much to say as I have nearly as long as I've been. Um, I, uh, I really didn't know what I was going to do. I, I had a pretty good score on the old dad's bed test and uh, ended up just going as a fire. I wasn't going to commit to anything until I knew what I was getting into. Um, kind of scared, left, uh, left home about 17 to do it. Had the, the, the folks sign me away. And, uh, definitely made a lot, of, a lot of good friends and had some memorable experiences that will stay with me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I didn't end up re-listing re because uh, of an injury I had in there. I'm kind of glad I came home just ended up meeting my wife and, and a few other things that I just don't think would have unfolded quite the way they did <laughs> without that. So, mm. yeah, but uh, definitely something that most people overlook is uh, the sacrifices that people have made. Uh, I personally, I wasn't, you know, shooting people or being shot at or anything like that, but I, I did have uh, some, some uh, grievous memories. Oh yeah, amen. Yeah. Amen. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Back. Well, I started out in ROTC as well, and and grew to first lieutenant in the ROTC. Was part of the part of the color guard and the uh, ah. rifle team, and so really in the ROTC, and um, and then moved on uh, U.S. Army Military Police 209th Detachment at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, and then I did some time at Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and a small stand at Fort Indiantown, Gap, Pennsylvania. Huh. All stateside, I was never deployed, you know, uh, across the states, and my service was uh, 1984 through 89, and, uh, and they had the early enlistment program back in the day, so during high school, uh, between my junior and senior year of break, High school, I went to basic training, and then uh, the two weeks after I graduated high school, I was off to AIT. Um, you know, when I graduated high school, so that's kind of what I did. All right, good, thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> 1989 to 1994, United States Air Force Crash Fire Rescue Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Italy, Turkey. South Korea, Japan, Honduras. Wow. And uh, Clinton got in, I got out. <laughs> in Montana, never regretted it, proud of my service. I've always been a flag waver. I don't care what your skin color is or what branch. Your brothers or sisters for life, and we are so humble. We're just spoiled in this country. Mm -hmm. We have it made. We yes. yes. Water's so strong, we get water. We put the light switch, we get electricity. There's other countries that they don't have that. No, that's true, man. No, that's really true. But I, I consider myself extremely blessed and <clears throat> have absolutely no regrets in my service. All right, amen. Good. Yeah. Okay, well, oh, I. No, okay. <laughs> well, I'm a veteran, sort of. You know, I feel like, you know, I, I kind of feel like yeah, you do, that, uh, you know, I, I did spend six years of uh, service during the Vietnam War era. I am not a combat veteran. I never was even deployed. Uh, I'm very sensitive about this stolen valor business. You know, when people are claiming that they are a war hero or whatever, and you know, that's not the case. That really irritates me because those who have really faced the fire, that's a whole different kettle of fish or those who have served, you know, for an extended period of time and, and I appreciate it. 
You know, there's nothing heroic about my enlistment. <clears throat> I was barely 17 years old. I had to have my parents sign. Uh, I was in Kodiak, Alaska on the island and uh, had an opportunity to join the Alaska National Guard. A friend of mine was going to join and so we had a sergeant come over to our place or whatever and talk to me about how much fun it would be to it'd be almost like joining the scouts, you know, which probably was kind of about uh, what it amounted to. And so we enlist, I enlisted, you know, there was nothing heroic about it. I didn't go to fight Charlie. I didn't go to protect America. I didn't do anything like that. I just, you know, it was the next thing to do, so I showed up. Uh, in my middle of my senior year, right after that, I mean, I, hadn't, I didn't even have a whole costume. And uh, we went on an operation called Operation Polar Strike back in the day in the interior of Alaska. Well, it was colder than a well digger's fanny in Alaska, I'll tell you that right now. It was 40 below and we were sleeping in tents. And uh, so it, that was kind of a curious, I had no idea in the world where in the world we ever were. Uh, so my, all, of my, my, all my war stories come about from that exact thing. And one, so here I hadn't been to basic training or anything, but they gave me a rifle. Of course, it had blanks in it like everybody else. We were playing war games and in the middle of one night I was out on guard duty and Somebody, you know, was wandering along, so I said, all who's there and all that kind of stuff, and they didn't respond right, so I commenced blazing away. And uh, so the whole camp erupted and people blazing away with blanks, so that was pretty exciting. <laughs> I had no idea who was who, but uh, so it was a fascinating time, so I will expect a lot more respect. Uh, anyway, I graduated high school and uh, moved to Portland. And I had no more thought about the military than anything in the world, but somehow they still remembered me. So I got a letter in the mail one day saying, you know, you are in the 104th Division, uh, the Timberwolf Division, show up out here at Sharf Hall in North Portland. So I went out there one day and it happened to be that the 104th Division, as it was a training unit, still is. You can look it up online, 104th Timberwolf Division. and. Uh, which I just did last night <coughs> again and it was a training unit so I had several years of, of being in even though I'd never even been to basic training so I, when I, they sent me out in the middle of my college years to basic training and then they sent me to AIT and by then I had a couple of years of service even though I had never done anything and uh, so then they turned right around and sent me to drill sergeant school so I became a uh, drill sergeant and uh, you know, I, uh, so much. Yeah. That? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, I'm proud of my service. I'm happy to have done it. I, I suspect, I mean, who knows? I doubt that I would be a preacher today had it not been for that experience. That was really a life shaping experience for me in a lot of ways. And, uh, and I appreciate that. I came to have a much greater appreciation for the military uh, and for the sacrifices we have here. You know, hearing Rob tell about in his career, eight years he was away. Well, what does that do to the family? You know, I mean, that's, uh, you know, Chris Payne and the, the kid there, you know, the kid, I mean, boy, that's, a, you know, that's hard. We right now in our congregation, uh, Caitlin is being ready to be deployed at the, you know, within a few weeks uh, to go somewhere, leaving two little dinky kids, you know, and, because when you're when you've signed on the dotted line, you are GI, you are government issue, you you know you owe your soul to the company store, and so the military is an interesting and a unique thing. Uh, I received a lot more than I gave. I have said over and over again. I feel in many respects like I got away cheap. I did everything I was asked to do. I think I did it well. Uh, back during the 60s, our unit was preparing uh, for civil unrest. There was a lot of unrest in Portland, and uh, we, as it turned out, never got called up to quell riots and stuff like that, as others did uh, during that, that time period. Uh, but still, uh, <coughs> those in my uh, age group uh, went to Vietnam. And I, I didn't, and I don't regret not going, but I feel like that those that really paid the price, uh, you know, some did not come back. I know that some of those that I was involved in training went to Vietnam. 
That's what I was training them for was to go to Vietnam. That was what, that was what we were doing. And uh, some, I'm sure, did not come back, and some came back messed up. Um, but uh, anyway, it's a challenge. So, Larry, I just want us to remember those who are not here, but their families are affected, like Bob Elder. Yes, I mentioned that in science school class, but here, you know, we had Bob and, and, uh, and Barb come to be a part of our flock in the congregation, and here, at the eleventh hour in Bob's life, he came to the Lord. Amen. And uh, boy, thank the Lord for that. Uh, and uh, Claudia and Beauty's dad, again, a World War II vet, very few of those around, he came just in the last little bit of his life, had the privilege of helping to lead him to the Lord in his living room, and he came to church here and uh, for a while, and uh, bless the Lord, man, here all of his life, he just barely squeaked in at the 11th hour uh, as far as the Lord is concerned. So, you know, we never know what difference we're making as a flock, uh, but I know that, you know, as I, I, I mentioned, that I went on a trip this year to the Bob and had... One, and the guys came to church here one uh, Sunday before we left. And one of the guys that had, if he's ever been to church anywhere at all much, uh, he, was, he was really impacted by you just by being here. It was so different than anything that he's ever experienced that it was an amazing thing. And uh, the other guy that was with him, I just got an email this week that said he had given him a Bible. And he promised to read it. Mm -hmm. You know, so we never know. But but thank the Lord for God's grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> it takes an amazing amount of logistics uh, and personnel to sustain a military. Uh, with those with many skills and different skills and tasks and roles, almost every job that has to happen in civilian life has to happen in the military. And so, you know, a lot of people, and I, as we hear this morning, you know, a lot of people that uh, felt like, you know, I served in the military, but, you know, I didn't have to do some of the cutting edge stuff that some of the rest did, but it, it's like the church. The church is comprised of people with all kinds of gifts and abilities and talents and whatever. And if every member of the body is contributing to the body, what they can do with their gifts and abilities and talents, the whole thing can work well. If there's only a few people doing it all, then it limps along and doesn't happen well. Uh, the military is much like that. You know, one never needs the military unless one needs the military. And if you need the military, there is no substitute. It is kind of like, it is, it's like our law enforcement. Uh, or uh, our first responders. You never need them unless you need them. But if you need them, you need them bad. The only reason that any nation needs a military at all is because of the reality of war. War is a nasty business, folks. And there is no one with a thimble full of sense that wants war. Uh, anybody that wants war is just not paying attention to life. There's no such thing as a sterile war. <clears throat> there, there's no such thing as war in which innocents are not harmed. War is a destroyer. It is a devourer. War is largely a tool of the enemy. Jesus uh, said, the thief comes only to kill or to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Honoring those who served in the military is not the same thing as being for war. Only lunatics want war. All war is a result of sin. Not all war is sin, but all war is a result of sin. God himself commanded war on some occasions to preserve his people or his word or his covenant. And God himself waged war. If you read the Bible, there are times when God did it single-handedly. One time, the children of Israel were all gathered together, and they were uh, surrounded or about to be attacked by an enemy, and God said, send the choir up. And the singers went up ahead and started singing, and God destroyed the enemy. 
You know, and we see that on a number of occasions in Scripture. So God is a God of love, absolutely a God of love and mercy and grace. God is also a God of war. And it is just like with many of us. You know, you ask me, well, what kind of a person am I? And, uh, you know, if I can, you know, if you and I are connected at a point where we can connect well and lovingly and kindly, that's the way it is. And I've mentioned many times, you break into my house in the middle of the night, I'm a different kind of a person there, you know. I mean, and that's how life is among humanity. And that's how God is. You know, God is a God of love. He offers salvation to all who will receive it. But God also is a God of war. And when he says, this is it, this is it. And uh, it, it's just kind of an interesting dynamic. Today we want to have our own little caricatures of God, and we probably all have them regardless. But God is God, and uh, we're not. <clears throat> all war is a result of sin, but not all war is sin. I think it's kind of like divorce. All divorce is a result of sin, but not all divorce is necessarily sin. You know, you see the distinction. Jesus said in Matthew 24, this is a passage that says, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes, and various places. All these are the beginning of birth pangs. We have, we sure see that. If you're not, if you're paying any attention, there are wars and rumors of wars right today. There are wars happening now, uh, you know, in all around the world in a variety of places. And there's rumors of more of them always. You know, North Korea and Iran and you know Afghanistan. Fill in the blank. Almost in almost every country. There are those kinds of wars and rumors of wars. But then here's some counsel that Jesus can, went on to say. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted, put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most, will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Folks, we are in this world. This world is broken. It's broken in all kinds of ways as we <laughs> ourselves are. We are a stinking mess, parts of us. Now there are moments of nobility and there are moments of nobility throughout the world just because humans are built, created in the image of God. So there are wonderful things that happen around the world, even in pagan nations. But there is a brokenness also among all humanity. All of us have been broken, and the only solution is Christ fixing us. And that seems to be a lifetime pursuit that as we pursue the Lord, He is able to continually fix us, but we still have this treasure in an earthen vessel. In such, in, in this, so in this world where there is such brokenness, there is a profound need for what we term the thin blue line. You know, a police, law enforcement. <laughs> Folks, if it were not for that thin blue line, using that as a, as a picture, what in the world would be our culture be like? No restraint on evil, you know. Today, people are afraid of all kinds. They're afraid to speed. They're afraid to break into places. They're afraid, you know, why? Because <clears throat> we have God has ordained that that the civil authorities bear the sword against the evildoer, and that's the same reason that we have a military. The military is there as comparatively a very thin line. When you look at all the people that, ha that are serving in the military now, it is a very, very small number in comparison to our whole country. And yet because of that small number, 
nations that otherwise might be inclined to say, we want to take what America has, you know, that line of those bearing the sword against the evildoer holds back the evil and permits us to live in freedom and safety. We live in freedom and safety almost unheard of in the world. We have been blessed stunningly. Why is the United States of America like it is uh, when there are other older, vastly older nations that are also rich in natural resources? Some people have said, well, the reason America is so great is because we have so many natural resources. Nah, there are natural resources all, all kinds of places. There are amazing natural resources in places that are complete. Uh, there is a term, but uh, they're, they're not good places to be. Why is that? I believe it is because in the United States of America, we have a foundation built upon the Judeo-Christian ethic and upon the scripture. Our law is Christian law, as opposed to those countries that are Buddhist law, or Hindu law, or Muslim law, or some other kind of law. You know, there is law everywhere in the world. Even there's law among the cartels. You know, they enforce their law, and, uh, you know, they even approach law enforcement people. I know that, you know, from uh, the Mexican side or whatever, that uh, often law enforcement people, they get a hold of them. The cartels enforce their law by getting a hold of a law enforcement person and say, okay, you have a choice here. It can be silver or lead. If you, you know, if you play ball with us, we'll pay you. You don't play ball with us, we'll kill you, we'll kill your family, we'll kill everybody that knows you, and they will. But that is an enforcement of law. But brother, it's a different kind of law. When you have the kind of a law that we have in the United States of America, imperfectly judged, imperfectly enhanced, and all those things, but the fact is we have a law based foundationally on the principles of God and His Word and the Christian ethic. A person is innocent till proven guilty. That didn't just come out of the sky. That came right from the Word. You have to have witnesses to establish it. Nobody is guilty on the basis of one witness. And all those things that are an impediment, say vigilantism, or just being able to have a king that comes in and says, okay, I don't like you, off with his head. That's efficient, all right. But it doesn't supply the protections that God's word and God's law has been inculcated into our uh, culture. It, we are blessed, folks. We are so stunningly blessed. Everybody that is born comes into some kind of a culture. You know, we, uh, unless you happen to have been born by, you know, just you know, a single mother on a deserted island, I mean, you've grown up in a culture of some sort, and I guess even there you would have. But here we are, and we are immensely shaped by it. Now, one of the challenges that all of us as believers have is that we are to be influencing our culture, not merely influenced by it. And so we as Christians, individually, as Christians, need to be the salt and the light to shed the light of Christ around the world. We need to be careful not to confuse American culture with Christianity. There's a whole lot of stuff about American culture that is not Christian. And as we drift farther and farther, in many respects, from God, you know, the, the darkness seems to creep in. If God's people would catch a fresh vision and begin to be light, man, what a difference we could make. You know, have you ever had a little flashlight that the battery is going dim on? And you can, you know, you flash that out there. And I mean, it, if, you're, if the room is pitch dark, that little light helps. You know, it can make a great difference. But man, you put fresh batteries in that thing and all of a sudden it'll light up the world. You know? I believe that as God's people, we need some fresh batteries 
You know, we need a fresh recharge, however you want to view it. But as God's people, we need to be, get serious about being the light of the world. Psalm 33 is a, a psalm I would like to read kind of, you know, in closing here, but I think it gives a, there are just some, some things in there that have to do more with the national level rather than just a, a personal level, but obviously every person plays into it. Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. You know, we do that every time we gather. You know, we, we sing together, and, and it, many of the songs are praise, some are worship, some are petition. You know, uh, when we sing God bless America, that is a prayer. You know, it is, it is acknowledging that God is God, but it is also a prayer saying, Lord, bless America. Please bless us. Help us to be worthy of that blessing and all that stuff. So sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Um, that's L-Y-R-E, not the L-I-A-R. It's hard for a lyre to bring uh, that kind of lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings, or a guitar of five, or however many strings one of those has. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy, for the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. Now that's an important thought. God loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. Now, now grasp that for a second. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. One of the things that I pray pretty regularly is that God would protect those that need to be protected and expose those things that need to be exposed. In our world, there are a host of evildoers individually. You know, there are evildoers in our community. There are evildoers in our state. There are evildoers in our government. There are evildoers around the world, you know, and we don't even often know who they are, but Man, I've been praying, God, protect those that need to be protected and expose those that need to be exposed. But this says, the Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. You know, Germany wanted to take over the world. Japan wanted to take over the world. You know, any number of other despots have arisen here, there, and around the world, you know, wanting to conquer the world. Alexander the Great wanted to conquer the world, you know. Uh, and made a good start on it. And, and so what? Then he died and, you know, is gone. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Now this was the psalmist David writing and primarily speaking about the nation of Israel at that time. But this is a principle that is true. I tell you, I don't care whether it's Afghanistan or whether it's America or whether it's Poland or fill in the blank with any place you want to be. If a nation will make the Lord their God, that nation will be blessed. You know? In America... There has been really no other God but Jehovah. I mean, it's not that there are not some cults. It's not that there are not some, you know, people of a variety of religious backgrounds, and we have the liberty for that to happen. But as a nation, no other God has been God but the God of heaven. 
I believe that's one of the major reasons that we are, are able to be blessed. But if that can go away, that blessing can go away. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men from his dwelling place. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all. He who understands all their works. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory. Nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. On those who hope for his loving kindness to deliver their soul from death. And to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him. Because we trust in his holy name. Let thy loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us. According as we have hoped in thee. We are recipients of a great, great heritage. We have the heritage of those who have passed on generation from generation the blessings of the gospel. There is a great host of witnesses that have gone on before that have witnessed to the gospel. For these 2,000 years, you know, we have that as a heritage. Regardless of what country we ever came from, there is a heritage of those who have kept the gospel message alive. And in America, we also have a heritage of those who gave of their lives to serve and many who actually gave their lives to serve so that we could have the liberties of freedom and, uh, that we experience today. I pray pretty often, probably not often <coughs> enough, but that God would bless America. I believe that the, re the way that that could happen and the re reason it has happened is because of the believers in Christ who are continuing to pray, continuing to seek God's face, continuing to be the salt and the light wherever we are. And that is a task to which we are all called. Not all of us, obviously, have served in the military. Not all who served in the military were godly. Not all of the soldiers who died in America's wars went right straight to heaven. Nobody's going to be in heaven because they were an American. Nobody's going to be in heaven because they uh, laid down their life in combat. You know? But there is a God-ordained role that people often can serve that ought to be honored whether the individual person